Good evening. Tonight's class is dedicated in honor of Ari Schattenstein's fifth birthday by his mom and dad and sister, Ida, David, and Nina Schattenstein. Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, may you enjoy many healthy, happy, and prosperous years with much nachas. So Rabbi Weinberg is sitting in his office in his synagogue, Bet Tefillah, when the telephone rings. He picks up the telephone. This is Jack Smith from the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Do you know a man by the name Maurice Cohen? Yes, I do, Rabbi Weinberg says. Is Mr. Cohen a congregant in your synagogue? Yes, he is, Rabbi Weinberg says. The agent of the IRS continues. Is it true that he contributed to your synagogue $10,000? Yes, he will, Rabbi Weinberg responds. Tonight, we explore a very enigmatic episode in the portion of Shalach. It's enigmatic, as we will see, from all angles. And we want to embark on a journey into the inner world of this character, the wood gatherer, in the portion of Shlach. Explore it from a halachic, Kabbalistic, Hasidic, psychological, spiritual, and practical point of view. Let us explore the text inside. It's at the conclusion of Shlach. You can open up your curriculums. On the bottom of the video, there is a PDF, which you can open up to read inside. This is source number one, a few verses from the end of Shlach, Numbers chapter 15. Vayiyu b'nei Yisrael b'amidbar. The Jewish people were in the desert, Vayimtsu ish mekoshish eitzim b'yoyim hashabbos. They found a man gathering wood on the day of Shabbat. Vayakivu oisei hamoitzim oisei mekoshish eitzim el Moshe v'el Aaron v'el kol ha'eda. Those who found the person gathering the wood brought him to Moses, to Aaron, and to the entire congregation. They put him under guard since it was not specified what should be done to him. The person should receive the death penalty. Let the congregation pelt him with stones outside of the camp. And this they did. And this concludes the episode about the wood gatherer. The last verse reads, The congregation took him out outside of, outside of the camp. They pelted him with stones. He died. As God commanded Moses. Now almost every angle and aspect of this episode is shrouded in mystery. Who was it? When did it happen? What exactly did he do? What was the reason for this punishment? It's like the guy who once said, the only thing we knew about Sam Rosenberg was that his name was not Sam Rosenberg. Almost the only thing we know about this wood gatherer is that we know so little about this wood gatherer. Number one, who was it? Who was this person? The Torah says they found Ish, a man. Who? Source number two explores the debate. In the Talmud and Gemara, Mesech the Shabbos, Dav Tzadik Vav, Ahmed Bey's Tractate Shabbos 96b, who was this man? Tanur Rabbanon, the rabbis learnt. Mekoshesh Zetzlavchot. 
the wood gatherer was a man named Tzlofchad, a person we become more aware of later in the portion of Pinchas, when Tzlofchad's five daughters approach Moses and lament, just because our father died and he did not leave any sons to inherit him, should we, his daughters, be deprived of having a lot in the Holy Land when we enter into the land? And ultimately, Moshe, in the name of God, communicates to them the message that, yes, they will inherit the property in the land, the territory in the land of Israel that their father, Tzlofchad, who has been, who passed away, should have inherited. This Tzlofchad, he is the gatherer of the wood. The verse says, the Jews were in the desert and they found a man gathering wood. Why the emphasis on the desert? We all know the Jews were in the desert. For 40 years they're in the desert now. Before any story, it doesn't say the Jews were in the desert. From Egypt, they went into the desert. Why does the Torah emphasize they were in the desert? Because in the story of the daughters of Tzlovchad and Pinchas, it says, Avinu meis bamidbar. The daughters tell Moses, our father died in the desert. And this teaches us. We compare the word Bamidbar there to the word Bamidbar here. This person died in the desert. Who was it? It was Slavchad. Rabbi Akiva believes that Slavchad is the man who was gathering wood and died. The son of Pseir told him, Akiva, Ben Kachu, Ben Kacha, Either way, whether you're right or wrong, you will one day be judged. If you're right, the Torah eclipses his identity. The Torah especially doesn't say who he was. And you are exposing his identity. And if you're wrong, you're slandering a righteous man, telling us that he desecrated the Shabbos. And the Gemara goes on to continue that Rabbi Akiva had a tradition of Gzeir Shava, meaning you compare the word Bamidbar there to the word Bamidbar here, and therefore the Torah is trying to disclose his identity. Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Pseido, argued with Rabbi Akiva, did not have this tradition. Who was he according to the second opinion, the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Pseido? He is one of those Jews who defiantly ascended to the land of Israel, betraying the commandment of Moses and God after the story of the spies in the, story, in the portion of Shlach, where the Jews have been ordained to remain in the desert 40 years, there was a group known as the Ma'apilim who defiantly decided that they will go conquer the land. They deeply regretted what has happened with the spies who dissuaded the entire nation of entering the land. They were determined and committed to go and conquer the land despite God's explicit command that they should not. And he was one of the per people who climbed up to go to the land and they were struck down by the Amalekites and another nation who came and declared war against these Ma'apilim. When did this story happen? The Torah doesn't give a date. It was when the Jews in the, were in the desert. That's a very nebulous date. They were in the desert for four decades. When did this happen? According to one opinion... Quoted in many commentators, it happened right after the Jewish people received the Torah. The Shabbos after the Jewish people received the Torah, the second Shabbos, there was already a man who violated and desecrated the Shabbos. According to another opinion, the famous opinion of Taisvis and Baba Basra, Kofiutesamid Beis, in the name of the Medrash, that this happened actually after the story with the spies which means it didn't happen right after the Torah was given, it happened a year later. A year plus later. When the spies came down and dissuaded the nation of entering into the land and God decreed that they would stay in the desert 40 years in order to dispel the notion that in the desert they would not be obligated to perform the mitzvahs, including Shabbos, this man sacrificed himself to violate Shabbos and be put to death so that the Jews would learn that even in the desert, in their, during their sojourn, for the next 40 years in the desert, they're obligated to perform the mitzvahs. Yet, 
according to all opinions, the story is told here in Shlach, following the story with the 12 scouts, the 12 miraglim which Moses sends to spy and survey the land of Israel to prepare the conquest of the Jewish people, and they come back. And the consequences are catastrophic when they give an ill report and tell the Jews there is no way we will enter the land and the decree is, as said, to stay there 40 years. Following that story, subsequently the Torah relates this story of the gatherer of wood, which means that according to all opinions, whether it happened chronologically after the story of the spies or it happened earlier, in, co- in sequence, in concept, conceptually the two stories must be juxtaposed, they are connected. We now come to the third mystery. What exactly did this person do? The Torah says he was mekoshish eitzim. What does it mean to be mekoshish eitzim? Eitzim means wood or trees or lumber. What does mekoshish eitzim mean? Here again, there is an argument. So there's an argument about who he is, when he did it, and what he did. And this argument is in source number three. Again, in Gemara, Mesech the Shabbos, Tzadik Vav, Ahmed Beis, you can open up your curriculum to source number three. A three-way argument, what this man did. Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Shmuel. Rav Yehuda said in the name of Shmuel, Mekoshish Mavir Arba Ames Birushus Arabim Hava. The Mekoshish was somebody who carried sticks and wood, four cubits in the public domain. On Shabbos, it is prohibited to transport, to carry, from a private domain into a public domain, from a public domain into a private domain, from a Rishus HaYachit to a Rishus HaRabim, from the house to the street, from this thoroughfare back to the house. It's also forbidden to carry something within the public domain itself. Four cubits, around six or seven feet, it is forbidden to carry anything any item in the public domain. In a private domain, you can carry as much as you want, but not in this thoroughfare in the public domain. So Rabbi Yehuda, in the name of Shmuel, says this person took sticks, took branches, took wood, and he carried them in the public domain. In a Braisa, we learned, Toilashava. He was a detacher of wood. He cut them off. This was his transgression. One of the labors that is prohibited on Shabbos is kotzer, reaping, detaching a plant, a fruit, a branch from its source. The sin of the Makoshish was not carrying the lumber in the public domain, but rather tolesh. He detached branches from their source. Rabbi Achib, Rabbi Yaakov, Rabbi Yacha, the son of Yaakov, said, Ma'amir hava. His violation was a different one. He gathered them together. One of the labors that is forbidden on Shabbos, in addition to the first one, motzi mirishus lirishus, transferring from one domain to another domain or in a public domain itself. In addition to kotzer, reaping or tolish, detaching, there is another labor forbidden on Shabbos called ma'amir. Ma'amir is gathering scattered pieces of grain or wood and making from them piles, binding them together, gathering them together in bundles. Just as they would do with grain, they would gather together the harvested crop and put them together in smaller bundles and larger bundles. This was Ma'amer. This is what he was doing. He was gathering the trees, gathering the wood. Three opinions of what this Mekoshish Eitzim did. So, we're not sure who he was, either Tzlofchad or one of the Ma'apilim who defiantly tried to conquer the land. We don't know when it was done, either in the early stages in the desert or later after the story of the spies, but we do know that it's told after the story of the spies. And we're not sure exactly what he did. Now, Rabbeinu Bechaya, one of the great biblical commentators, and you have this in source number four in your curriculum, asks the following question. 
Rabbeinu Bechayi wants to know why the Torah uses the word mekoshesh to describe gathering wood. According to the third opinion that he was gathering the wood together, scattered wood, he was putting them into piles. Why the word mekoshesh, the proper word should have been melakate. Mekoshesh is used for straw. For wood, the Hebrew word used, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, is lalakit, malakit. Why the word mekoshesh? And Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar answers and he explains that mekoshesh is made up of two words. Mikav, sheish. Explaining that this person left the line of six. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that there are six dimensions to everything. The four sides, east, west, north, and south, up and down. Three dimensions. Shisha Ktsava is the three dimensions corresponding to the divine six attributes known as Chesed, Gevura, Tiferes, Netzach, Hoid, and Yesoit. Love, strength, discipline, empathy, victory, consistency, and bonding, foundation. And Yatza Mikav Sheish, Miko Sheish. He left the line of six. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that Shabbos, the seventh day, represents the symbol, the acknowledgement that all of the dimensions of the world, the six dimensions, were created by God. And he did not allow the six angles to be sanctified by the seventh day of Shabbos. And that's why he's called Mekoshesh. Which obviously needs some more explanation. Why would the Torah call him Mekoshesh? He left the line of six. How does this capture the st- essence of the story? Is it just because to say that he violated the Shabbos? But then the point is that he left number seven as well, not just number six. He did not allow the six to enter into seven to be sanctified by the seventh day. But Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar believes this is the etymology of Mekoshesh, Mikavshesh. Now we come from the realm of halacha, of Jewish law, and basic commentary, biblical commentary, to the realm of Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. Source number five, Zohar. The Zohar, in the portion of Shlach, page 157, of Kufnun Zayin Amir Aleph, the Zohar gives a new explanation of the story of the Mekoshesh Eitzim. Omer Rebchia. Rebchia says, Ksiv vayimtsu ish Mekoshesh Eitzim b'yoyim ha-Shabbos. They found a man gathering wood on Shabbos. Man Eitzim hocha. What are the trees doing here? Eitzim means wood, it also means trees. Uman havada, who was it? Eladot slavcha, this was slavcha. He was inquiring about these trees. Which one is superior to the other? He was exploring the two trees, Eitzim. And he wanted to know which one is superior to the other. He was insensitive to the glory of his master, V'achlev Shabbos L'Shabbos. He substituted the Shabbos of the day with the Shabbos of the night. Shabbos day with Friday night. This is the meaning of the verse later by Tzlovchad in Pinchas. The daughters of Tzlovchad said he died in his sin. He died in the sin of sex. There was a sin of sex. What is the meaning of the Zohar? Here we have a new explanation of Mekoshesh. Mekoshesh in Hebrew could mean gather. It can also mean, as we saw, uproot. It can also mean carry. But the Zohar gives a new explanation. Mekoshesh, as in the Hebrew word, hekesh, lahakesh, to compare, to contrast. To compare two things to each other. Mekoshesh ate him. He was examining two trees and comparing them. Which two trees? So the commentators of the Zohar explained, based on the whole context of the Zohar there before and after, 
the two famous trees God planted in the Garden of Eden. The Eitz HaChayim and the Eitz HaDas. There was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, Tovera, the tree of knowledge of good and bad. God told Adam and Eve, do not eat from the Eitz HaDas, Tovera, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They went and they did eat from that tree. And this man, Slavchad, was comparing the trees. Which one is greater than the other one? Insensitive to the respect of his master, exchanging Shabbos day with Friday night. What does this mean? Why was he comparing trees? What's the connection with Slavchat? What's the connection to Bechet Vav, the sin of six? We now come from the Kabbalistic realm into the Hasidic realm. Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad school of Kabbalah and Hasidus, explores these ideas in two of his discourses. One, a discourse about the Mekoshish Eitzim, the gatherer of wood, in the year Tovkuf Nun Vav, what is that, 1796? The other, the last year of his life, Tovkuf Ayin Beis, 1812. His son, the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Doiv Ber, known as the Mittler Rebbe, based on the ideas of his father, continues to explore and elaborate his ideas in his discourses. The third Lubavitch Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, a son-in-law of the second of the Mittler Rebbe and a grandson of the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe's daughter's son, the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe the Tzemach Tzedek, in his discourses, in his set known as Er HaTorah, continues to comment, explain, and explore the ideas of his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, about the wood gatherer. And then his son, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe Maharash, Rabbi Shmuel, in a discourse of the year Tofresh Lamed Gimel. Tofresh Lamed Gimel would be 1873. In Shlach develops also a discourse, a Hasidic discourse, bringing the previous information together and adding and explaining more. And then the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe, in a discourse of Tovshin Yud Gimel, 1953 of Shlach, once again builds on the ideas of his predecessors, applies it, elaborates it, and allows us to appreciate and internalize the ideas even more. And tonight, I want to share one point of what is a very elaborate discussion continuing over generations. But to take out one point of this discussion, explain it with the assistance of some other sources, and then attempt to apply it based on the ideas discussed in those discourses. What was the mistake of the spies? Why did they not want to enter into the Holy Land? Why did they come back from the land and instead of encouraging the Jews to follow their destiny into the land, they dissuaded an entire nation, causing national hysteria and the conviction of the people, no, we do not want to enter the land which results in God's decree that they shall not. Only the next generation, 40 years later, would enter the land. How? The 12 spies, great men, the Torah says. Great personalities, tremendous leaders. How can they fall so low? So there are many explanations. One of the classical explanations given in Lakuti Torah by Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi was that the spies wanted to remain in the desert because of their great spiritual sensitivity. They knew that in the desert they can afford to live in a spiritual, transcendental cocoon, engulfed by clouds of glory, escorted and being led by Moses and Aaron, the greatest prophet at all time, who is communicating to them wisdom from the mouth of God himself. No need to worry about paying a mortgage, paying rent, paying tuition paying for insurance, paying for food bills, 
no stress, no IRS, no taxes, no recession. Mana comes down every morning from heaven and they enjoy their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All of their needs, their physical needs were provided for as they were submerged in a reality and an environment of undiluted godliness, holiness, and spirituality. They loved the ecstasy of heaven. They loved the bliss of a life divorced, of material crassness and grossness, of the headaches and obsessions that come with the materialistic the wor- world and physical demands and stress. They wanted to continue to bask and bathe in the pure, pristine wellsprings of Torah that the master of Torah was communicating to them every day and every night. They knew that once they entered the land, the system would change. Now they would have to set up their own government. They would have to create a political system. They would have to create a military entity. They would have to begin engaging in business and become agricultural farmers. And they would have to run a country on their own with all of the challenges and trials and tribulations and corruption that comes with it. Just to give a simple example, although very poor and incomplete, some of the early Zionists were very ideological people. And so in some of their hearts, a strong fire and love of Zion burnt. And I'm not now getting into any other aspects and details of the debates, Zionism, throughout the last generations. But even some of the greatest ideological personalities knew and saw that once a state was established, with all of the opportunities and with all of the challenges of leadership, the potentiality and the reality of corruption, of negative energy, of selfishness, of narcissism, of manipulation, of power getting to people, kills an ideology. It certainly dulls it. The spies were very well acute and aware of this truth of life on a collective level, on an individual level, and therefore they decided that it is not good for the Jewish people to enter into the land of Israel. It will destroy Judaism. It will compromise the mission of the Jewish people. It will dilute their destiny. It will degrade them rather than elevate them. To put it in other words, they wanted to continue to eat from the Eitz HaChayim and not from the Eitz HaDas. There are two trees representing two states of consciousness and two very different forces. The Eitz HaChayim is the tree of life. The Eitz HaDas, Toi is the tree of knowledge between good and evil, meaning it's a tree that represents the mixture between positivity and negativity, light and darkness, opaqueness and transparency. And eating from that tree represents the person going into a domain and a world of struggle where he or she must continuously distinguish and search for sparks of light within darkness to be able to distinguish between negativity and positivity, between toiv and ra, between good and evil, questions of what is moral, of what is ethical, of what is right, of what is wrong, to be able to dig through the layers of materialism and find the goodness and the holiness and the sparks of godliness there, it's a very different life. The spies wanted to eat from the Eitz HaChayim, the tree of life, not the Eitz HaDaz, Tov When God tells Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree and they go and eat it, suddenly they're ashamed with their nakedness. Suddenly God has to ask Adam Ayeka, where are you? He doesn't know where he is anymore. Not only physically, but psychologically and emotionally, confusion sets in. Suddenly the battle and war within every human soul between positivity and negativity and in the whole world begins to take root and to rage. And the spies wanted the Eitz HaChayim over the Eitz HaDas. The world of the spiritual over the world of the physical. The world of heaven 
and not the reality of earth. But they were mistaken. Their intentions, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi says, may have been idealistic, pure, noble, and quite understandable. But it was a sin, it was a mistake. And the reason it was a mistake is because the mission and the destiny of the Jewish people collectively and individually was to enter into the physical world and sanctify it. To go into the realm of darkness and transform it into light. To warm up a cold world. Just to remain in a heavenly, transcendental sphere was not the ultimate objective of reality. They failed to appreciate the truth that the ultimate mission statement of the Jewish people was to transform and revolutionize the landscape of the physicality of the earth and turn it into an abode for God. To bring down a fragment of heaven into planet earth and to generate the kiss between heaven and earth where the physicality of the human being and of the world is ultimately transformed. Where the person goes into the Eitz Hadas and must refine his or her base character, must elevate and educate his or her animalistic consciousness, must deal with the layers of darkness which eclipse the presence of God in the world, and not run away from it into another plane, but rather deal with it, confront it, and ultimately transform it. Only in a land where they will have to, yes, run a country, where they will have to generate their own income, where they will have to run their own government, where they are going to deal with the day-to-day responsibilities of life in the real world. Here will they reach their ultimate destiny, to make a home for God in the lowest elements of reality, to transform darkness into light, and to revolutionize the very earthiness of the human psyche, and the very earthiness of the human heart, and the very ego of the human consciousness, and to turn that into a place where truth and godliness is revealed and manifested. The spies had a great idea, beautiful idea, nebulous idea, but it's not ultimately what Judaism is about. Judaism is about integration, about synthesis. Just as God cannot be defined as physical, He also can't be defined as spiritual. Just as God cannot be defined as being earthy, also cannot be defined as being heavenly. Truth transcends both heaven and earth, spirituality and physicality. And it's in the integration and the synthesis where they can touch the truth of the divine. And thus the mistakes of the, sp- the mistake of the spies. comes now this character right after the story of the spies and he's going to undo their mistake. Who was he? Either Tzlofchand or one of the Ma'apilim. But either case, he loved Eretz Yisrael. He loved the land. Tzlofchand, we know, loved the land because five of his daughters came and I guess in the first feminist revolution come to Moses and say it's not fair just because we don't have brothers therefore we will not inherit the land and they persuade Moshe who goes to God and God says they're right they love the land the reason they love the land so much is their father loved the land Slavchad loved the land what parents really love goes over to the children. Not what parents say they love, or preach they love, or pontificate they love, because values are not taught, they're caught. But what you really love, and what you're really ready to sacrifice for, this will take root in the heart and soul of your children. Tzlovchad loved the land, and there his daughters loved the land. According to the second opinion, Rabbi Yehuda ben Seir, he was one of the Ma'apilim, certainly, he could not make peace with them remaining in the desert and defying 
Moses' instruction, he went up and sacrificed his life to go into the land. It failed. This person, whether according to the first opinion or the second opinion, came from the opposite perspective of the spies. And therefore, he was Mekoshish Eitzim. What does the Zohar say? What's Mekoshish Eitzim? He was comparing the trees. Which tree? The Eitz HaChayim, the tree of life, to the Eitz Hadas, to the tree of struggle. And according to the Zohar, he was looking which one is greater than the other. The Mekoshesh hates him, this person says to himself, the spies made an error because they chose the tree of life over the tree of struggle. It's then obvious perhaps that the Eight Sadas may be even greater than the Eight Sachayim. The tree of struggle is greater than the tree of life. Physicality in its source is deeper than spirituality. The ego may, be, may come from a deeper place than the soul. Concealment is rooted in a deeper place in God than expression. The Orachama, one of the commentators on Zohar says, this was his conclusion, the Eitz Adas was greater than the Eitz Achayim. It was superior to the Eitz Achayim. Why? Because the ultimate objective of existence, as the Medrash famous, famously puts it, and the Tanya explains it in chapter 36. God craved that we build for him a home in the lowest world, in the lowest element of reality. Not that holy people do holy things, but that unholy people do holy things. Not that a holy world becomes even holier, but that an unholy world becomes holy. That the sweetness, that the harmony, that the truth of elokus of godliness permeates and penetrates the crass and brute and gross world of Gashmias of materialism. So Slavchot comes to the conclusion that the Eitz Hadas is greater than the Eitz Achai. The spies wanted a world of transcendence. They crave to ascend and to transcend the physical containers of our reality and to bask in the wellsprings of pristine spirituality. But they were mistaken. So he's Mekosh Shetzim, he's now comparing the woods. He comes to the conclusion and says, they were mistaken. This means the Eitz Hadas is greater than the Eitz Achayim because this is the ultimate objective of existence and we don't need the Eitz Achayim, we don't need the tree of life. Ah, this is the meaning. Mikav Sheish. He leaves the line of six. In Kabbalistic and Hasidic writings, there is an important concept to understand. There are the six attributes, chesed, gvura, teferis, netzach, yesoid, and there's the seventh faculty known as malchus, associated with earth, associated with separateness, associated with the physical world. He separated between the six and the seven, meaning the earth, the seventh level, need not be connected to the higher six attributes, which represent the Eitz HaChayim, the tree of life. It can be on its own, autonomous, because its source is even higher. The spies went to one extreme. They gave supremacy to spirituality over physicality, to the exclusivity of spirituality. The Makosha Shaitzim now fought their idea with the opposite extreme. He gave supremacy to the physicality over the spirituality, to the eight sadas, to the seventh level, over the first six levels. Because the way the Kabbalah explains it, God's expressions represent Chesed, Gvur, Teferis, Netzach, Yisoid. Malchus represents the quality of godliness which detaches from the source and gives vitality 
inspiration and life to a separate egotistical reality which perceives itself as outside of God's all-pervading reality. Mikav Sheish, he left the six. He believed the Eitz Adas is greater than the Eitz Achaim. You don't need the Eitz Achaim. The main thing is submerge yourself within the Eitz Adas because that's where you'll touch the divine. That's where you'll touch the essence of reality. He gave tremendous sanctity and credence to the struggle of life, to the physicality of life, to the earthiness of a human being, to the nature of a person, feeling that that is the arena where God's ultimate objective is implemented. Did he have a point? He had a point, but the Torah says, when it begins to describe the story, Vayimtsu ish mekoshesh eitzim b'yayim ha-Shabbos. He was doing it on the day of Shabbos. In middle of the weekdays, during the six days of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, nu. We are charged and empowered to go into the eight Sadas reality and talk the talk and walk the walk and fight the fight and excavate the godliness that's buried beneath the layers of ego and crassness within our soul and within the world around us. But in order to be able to sustain the consciousness of the eight sadas in a way that it does not pull down the person. You must one day a week on Shabbos go into the world of the eight sachayim. Shabbos is a time when the Jew does go beyond the world, when the Jew does not engage in creative labor, when the Jew does not recognize the value of multiplicity. And the power of revealing oneness within fragmentation. And the deep mission to go into the world of divisiveness and introduce harmony into the world of multiplicity. Shabbos is the day which is holy, which is sacred, which is transcendental. A day when we do say goodbye and bid farewell to the stress and anxiety, to the fragmentation and divisiveness, to the multiplicity and dichotomy in which the world pulls us asunder throughout the whole week. Shabbos allows the person then to go into the world of Eitz Hadas and not end up in Ra, in negativity, but sublimate the negativity. But if you escape the realm of the Eitz Hachayim, if you bid farewell to the Tree of Life, and you give too much credence to the Eitz Hadas, then what happens is the Eitz Hadas can schlep you down and pull you down rather than allow you to elevate it. It degrades you. Now we can understand what the Mekoshesh Eitzim did. Three opinions in the Gemara. Opinion number one, He is carrying the wood in the public domain, four cubits, Mavir, Dalad, Amiz, B'rish, Sarabim. Shabbos, we do not transfer things from the public domain to the private domain, from the private domain to the public domain, or in the public domain itself. Because Shabbos represents the idea that there is no public domain. Shabbos, there is one private domain, Rishus HaYochid, a single domain representing the oneness and exclusivity of Yechidah Shalolam, of the oneness in the world, cosmic oneness. Shabbos is a day we dedicate to prayer, to meditation, to learning, to spiritual growth, to spending time with our loved ones and with our soul and with our God. Shabbos is a day when you have one domain, the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life, where there's no multiplicity, where there's no fragmentation. Shabbos is a day of oneness. Came this Mekoy Shesheitzim, and what did he do? He took trees and he carried them four cubits in the public domain, representing creative work within the public domain, within the public arena, 
Why? Because in his mind, Rishus Rabim, this is the real holiness. The public domain, the domain of fragmentation, this is where truth is happening. The spies were mistaken. The Eitz Hadas, ah, this is where you touch God. The second opinion takes it even a step further. He didn't only carry the tree in the public domain, the trees in the public domain. He was toilish. He uprooted the trees from the source. He detached them from the source. Everything in the world has a source. Everything comes from somewhere. Children come from parents. Branches and trees come from the earth and they get nurtured from the earth as vegetables and fruits. Everything has a source and physicality also has a source. The source of everything in this world is the spiritual energy, the divine vibrations of godliness that give it existence and vitality. It has a source. But the Mekosh HaShetzim was a toilage. He uprooted the source. He uprooted, he detached the trees from the source. He detached physicality from spirituality. He began to give credence and significance to the physicality divorced from the spirituality. For him, the physical world itself, divorced from spirituality, became the objective of life. The Eitz Hadas detached from the Eitz Hachayim, and what he did not realize was this. If you want the physical to be able to reveal those deep levels of godliness that only the physical could reveal, you must make sure that it's linked to the spiritual. Because if it's not linked to the spiritual, then the physical can schlep down the person rather than be sanctified by the person. Were the spies mistaken? They were mistaken. They were mistaken in the sense that they ran away to the transcendental world. So he ran away to the other world. He ran to the physical world. But Judaism is about the balance, about the integration, about the synthesis. Yes, it's true that the Eitz Hadas has in it something that the Eitz Hachayim doesn't have. It's true that there is something in earth which heaven doesn't have, but in order to be able to reveal that in earth, earth needs heaven. Earth needs to receive its nurture from heaven, and the tree has to receive its nurture from the earth. And that way, when the physicality is linked with its spiritual source, it can then even exceed it and grow beyond that. But he was tole, she detached it from its source. And the third thing in the Talmud he was ma'amer. He was taking trees and twigs and wood, logs that were scattered, and he gathered them together, representing the fact that the ultimate objective of life is to gather the scattered pieces of the world and make them into a bundle, unite them again, transform multiplicity into unity. But on Shabbos, it's a sin. During the weekdays, detach, carry, make a bundle. But on Shabbos, when you enter into the private domain where there's no emphasis on the physicality of the world, one day a week where you must enter into the pure world of the spirit, the pure world of the soul, that way, when you come out of Shabbos, the next six days of the week, you confront the physical world and you reveal its true essence, its true divine essence, and you don't fall prey to the external veneer of physicality, which can take a person away from his spiritual mission and his relationship with God. And these are the three opinions in the Talmud, reflecting the soulful idea in the Zohar, that they were, he was comparing the trees, the Eitz HaChayim and the Eitz Adas, and exchanging Shabbos with Shabbos. Shabbos morning represents Eitz HaChayim. Friday night still represents relaxing from the six days of the week, leaving the world of the Eitz Adas, elevating the world of the Eitz Adas. And for him, he exchanged Shabbos day with Shabbos night, which means he gave supremacy and superiority to the Eitz HaDas, Friday night over the Eitz HaChayim. And the result of that is stoning, which represents spiritually. Lekut Teir Shabbos Shuva says it represents that a person's heart becomes like stone. A person's heart becomes hard, apathetic. Because when you don't have the pure energy of Shabbos to give meaning and vitality the six days of the week, then what happens is the person falls into the world of materialism and develops a hardness rather than a sensitivity 
to the deeper forces. Evan is also Aleph Ban. God says, Rogam Ba'avon and pelt him with stones. Ban, 52, is the same gematria, the same numerology, like the word behema, the animal. Aleph represents the oneness of God. What he needed was the relationship between Evan, Aleph, and Ban to be able to bring the oneness into the world of the animal. Bring the oneness into the world of multiplicity. Bring the harmony, Hashem Echad, into the six days of the week. Amzu yotzarti li teilasi yisaperu, the prophet Yeshaya says. My nation is zu. They bring together Zion and Vav. The seven is always linked with the six. They don't say earth doesn't need heaven. Eitzadaz doesn't need Eitzachayim. The seven is always linked with the six. Shabbos elevates the worlds. Amzu Yotzartili. It's a nation which pers- persists that the Zion and the Vav must work together. <laughs> and what this means practically in a person's life is that although we were charged with the mission of being in a world which is fragmented, which is divisive, which threatens to undermine us with its stress, difficulties, and challenges which come from the daily contact with our own inner animal and with the animal without. The human being, the Jew, must have a nest, a nest of holiness, of transparency, of clarity, where he or she enters so that when they come back into the world, they should be able to confront it and not fall apart by it. This is what prayer is. This is what learning is. This is what Shabbos is. An inner place of wholesomeness that you never leave completely. That you never give up on. That you never compromise on. An inner place of wholesomeness beyond the layers of stress so that when you enter into the world, you can transform it rather than it transforming you. The following story was related by a man named Reb Moshe Leib Rochstein. Reb Moshe Leib Rochstein was a secretary, a masker, who worked for the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he related the following episode. He was once traveling here in America to New Hampshire, Bethlehem. And on the road... He was sitting near a Jew, a Polish, a chassid, a chassid who came from Poland, and after the war arrived to the United States of America. And this man said, Reb Moshe Leib, are you a Lubavitcher? And he said, yeah. He said, I'll tell you a story about your Rebbe. This was the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Yosef Yitzchak Schneiders, and he said, when we came to America, my family and I went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe to receive a blessing. And before we went in, my wife tells me, you know, I would like the Rebbe to bless our young boy. And I said, fine. We went into the room of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson. He lived in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, 770 Eastern Parkway, on the second floor, until his passing in 1950. And we went into his room. And we asked what we asked, and we spoke about what we spoke. And then my wife gave me a little tug, you know, asked the Rebbe to ask the Rebbe to bless our son, our young son. So I did. I asked the Rebbe if he would give a bracha, if he would bless our little boy. And the Rebbe said yes, and motioned that we should bring him over to him. And I brought my young son over to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe put his hands on my son's head and began caressing his head from different angles and different sides. He was going around and around my son's head, touching it in different places. 
It was very strange to us. It is customary that you want to bless somebody. You sometimes place your hands over the person's head and you give them a blessing. But he didn't just place his hands over our son's head. He was caressing his head and touching it in different places, going around and around. It was extremely strange to us. We left the room. A little while later, something happened. We live on the fifth floor in an apartment building. And our son was playing near the window. And he fell out of the window, five stories down. And he fell on his head, straight on his head. Not on his feet, not on his legs, not in any other part of the body. Smack on his head. Whoever saw the horror scene, the frightening scene, was certain that this was his end. But a few moments later, our son stood up and walked into the building. And we understood that those moments with the Rebbe, the Rebbe didn't only bless him, he created a cushion for his head. He caressed his head, touched his head in different places. He created a spiritual cushion, engulfing our son's head with an energy, with an aura, that unfortunately when he falls a little while later, his head is protected. This captures very much the point being conveyed here. The Mekosh Eitzim loved the land of Israel. Tzlofcha, the Mapilam. He was determined to undo the mistake of the spies. He went to the other extreme as he decided the Eitz Hadas is greater than the Eitz Hachayim. Physicality, selfhood, ego, the animal consciousness, the human identity, is Iberalis, is above everything. There was a truth there. There is a holiness in physicality, deeply embedded in it, that is greater than spirituality. It's one of the great ideas discussed in Hasidic philosophy. But in order to explore that, you must make sure your head is cushioned. When you go out to the real world, which is ultimately the objective of God to sublimate it and sanctify it, you must make sure that your head is cushioned, is engulfed with the Eitz HaChayim, with the Tree of Life. That way, when we often get pushed down in life, and sometimes we fall and fall hard, our head, our soul, our identity, remains protected. Have a good night.